Thank you to the sponsors of today's episode, Lucky Tree, Northern Home, and Northern Kitchen. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Pod Packa. Today we have another very special guest. Uh, our guest today grew up in the Stevens Point area. We're expanding a little bit more out of Wapaka area. Uh, and she has had a very successful career in acting, comedy, and you may know her the best from the Drew Carey show as one of the most iconic characters in the late 90s, early 2000s, Mimi. Here she is. It's Kathy Kenny. Welcome to Pod Packa. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I always feel to confirm that I did indeed play Mimi, that I that I should say, bite me. Oh, yeah. That well, was... I, have, I have something here. I've, I've been a huge fan of yours for a very long time, ever, ever, all the way back to Seinfeld. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And Mimi was, was I mean, that was incredible. That is an iconic character. It's got to be one of the top five, in my opinion. And someone to be able to bring that to life. That's amazing. But I want to take this opportunity to thank you. Several years ago, and this was, uh, we have a mutual friend, Barb. Mm -hmm. And uh, I told her how big a fan I was of yours. A week later, I got this in the mail. Oh, oh that's so nice of her. And that's my real signature. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to thank you for that. And, and as I told, we were talking earlier, I told you I'm going to be uh, we're in the process of opening up uh, a distillery and a tasting room. If you're with your permission, I would like to hang this in there. By all means, please. Well, do. I appreciate it. Thank you. But no, I always want, I always thank you for this. This hung in my office, uh, my old office for several years. So mm -hmm. well, that was really, she's a good friend to do that for you. That oh, was yeah. nice. And uh, I grew up in the shadow of the Point Brewery. So, uh, you know, there was a they had a whistle that, that blew at seven in the morning, noon <laughs> and five. So I was like a little trained dog. You know, <laughs> we, we didn't need alarm clocks. We just we woke up at seven. You know, I came home for lunch at noon when the whistle blew. And then when I come home from school and I'd play, my, my mom would say, be home by the time the whistle blows. And I'd be like, okay. And that whistle <laughs> would blow at five and I'd come home for supper, you know. And uh, so beer, I've known, you know, <laughs> we didn't drink it. My grandfather used to make beer. Oh, and I remember cool. going over to his, uh, out to his house, I was eight. And he was said, you want a beer? And my mother's like, no, no. And I was like looking at, and he gave me a beer. It was green, oh. green beer. I imagine your beer is much better than that though. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I also want to mention too, I really enjoyed you on Arachnophobia. Thank you. So. I mean, m spiders, what can I say? And uh, the uh, here's a tip in case you're plagued with spiders. Um, the guy that was the spider wrangler. Spiders don't like the smell of pledge furniture polish. So oh. if he wanted the spider to walk, you know, down this straight line, he would spray pledge on either side of it to keep that spider within that area. Wow. I know. So uh, there was one year where I don't know, we had a lot of spiders outside. And I so I sprayed my window sills you know, the inside of the well with pledge to keep them all out. And it worked. It worked well. Spiders. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not really a big spider fan. It was hard for me to watch that movie, but I actually watched it three times. So. Yeah. It's a good movie. And it sad, is. sadly, the lead actor, Julian Sand, is uh, missing. He He's a hiker and he was hiking um somewhere in the mountains near here and uh disappeared a few weeks ago and they haven't found him wow. yet which is a little sad note there yeah. so what got you into all this i mean what was your what was the point there the, what was the yeah i screwed that up joe edit that no no i like <laughs> i like that idea of that what what was the point i mean really i don't you know i mentioned this at my high school reunion actually was that um you know, when I graduated from high school, I had no idea what I was going to do. And my, I was on the square in Stevens Point, you know, drinking 
uh, probably not beer because I didn't really like beer. Sorry, that was, you know, I was only 18. You could drink it in the bars at 18. And my friend said, what are we going to do now? You know, she, and I go, well, let's go be nurses, you know, and she was like, okay. And so we went to the technical school and we signed up. And then I thought, I don't, I wanted to travel. That's all I ever wanted to do. So uh, my father had passed away and I was receiving social security and for as long as I stayed in school till I turned 21. So I went to college and I went semester abroad and I came back and, you know, travel broadens you. And mm -hmm. uh, I still had no goals or, and all I knew how to do was be a bartender and run some power tools. And uh, so I ended up moving to New York and had a lot of different jobs. It's the kind of thing, it would take all hour for me to list all the ridiculous and horrifying jobs that I had. But my friend, and finally, uh, now the answer to your question, my friend um, who's my writing partner who lives on the East Coast, Cindy, wanted to be an actress, but she hated to do things by herself. So uh, she was taking an improvisational comedy class and she made me take it with her because it was a scary neighborhood. And, uh, and so I got there and Cindy tells the story that I'm not really aware of, but she said, within 15 minutes, everybody knew that I was funny, except for me. And that was sort of the kickoff. And interestingly enough, one of the people that we were working with was Bruce Willis, who's one of the nicest people I ever met. And um, so I started out in improvisational comedy, worked with a guy who wrote a movie, wrote a part for me. I came out to Los Angeles. A friend of mine from junior high was a manager. He became my manager and blah, 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 blah. There you go. There you go. So, <laughs> uh, so however you want to look at it, it's a, uh, kind of a I think that my life is the perfect example of one there's always something more and two if you can get out of your own way you can pretty much ride the wave to whatever you want even though you don't know what you want I mean I never intended to be an actor so there seems to be some kind of I don't want to divine guidance that smacks you on the back of the head and says just walk through the fear go ahead and that's all i did i, I, so, I agree with that advice thanks. i do i, I truly do <laughs> yeah um, my, my whole life has been one giant risk after another <laughs> yeah i think that that's the biggest problem that you know people deal with and being young younger you know joe it's that it's life is this huge adventure and it's certainly uh, scary. That's true. But if you just take one tiny little step and just keep saying yes, 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 and find people to surround yourself with who are positive and who make you feel good about yourself, you know, there's it's no fail. That's a no fail thing. You know, I, I think did you, when you mentioned that I, I'm a writer, I think I need to interject at this point that I write. Um, like inspirational books <laughs> so that you don't go, what the heck? You know, I mean, I just, I'm really, it's really clear to me that um, taking these teeny tiny steps, just walking through your fear is the way and finding people to surround you uh, who are positive and who are uh, good. You know, that that's the way to be successful in life. That's my idea of success, not how much money, you make or you know what big thing you build but if you could surround yourself with loving kind friends and walk through the fear yeah you got it this episode of pod pack is sponsored by office outfitters bill zimmerman the owner of office outfitters was a guest on pod Packa, and that is one of the few episodes with a profanity warning which makes it a unique and interesting episode you may want to check out that episode of Pot Packa, but you definitely want to check out Office Outfitters for all of your needs in printing, office supplies, janitorial supplies, office furniture, and promotional products. Go to Office Outfitters website or visit their retail location in Wapaka for all of your business needs. This episode is presented by Northern Kitchen. Northern Kitchen is a brand new store 
that is in Lucky Tree's family of stores on Main Street in downtown Opaka. This new kitchen store is on the corner in the last block on North Main Street. It looks fantastic in there. There are lots of great kitchen gadgets that you cannot find anywhere else in the area. Make sure to shop at Northern Kitchen on Main Street in Wapaka. I'm 21. I'm, I'm at UWSP right now. You went to UWSP as well. Yeah. What advice would you give to uh, UWSP students? Uh, and I'm meaning University of Wisconsin Stevens Point for those who don't know. I think, you know, this is 21 probably the most difficult age because you're you're older and you feel like you should know what you want to do and you want to know what's going on uh, you think you know what's going on but you really are at the start of your life and the and that again that idea that there's always something more like I feel like uh, if I could talk to my 21 year old self or to talk to you I would say um, don't worry about not having an idea of what you want to do with your life. You don't, you don't have to know what you want to be when you grow up, when you're 21 years old, because it just keeps changing. If you keep yourself open to what's going past you, it, there's always something there to grab onto. And, you know, for me, I took, I took that improvisational comedy class to help my friend Cindy. And uh, I remember being asked to perform with the comedy group from the school, you know, and in that moment on that stage in a tiny crowded little room, I felt for the first time uh, alive. I felt this is what normal feels like, which is such an odd word and means absolutely nothing, but it made me think of, you know, I had a friend who had been a heroin addict and he said, the first time that he shot up heroin, he went, oh, this is what everybody's feeling. This is what it's like to be alive. I felt that on stage. And I knew in that moment, that was what I was supposed to do. Finding the thing that you enjoy, finding a thing that you love, no matter what other people are saying. You know, I mean, people looked at me like, you're, you can't, you know, my, I had an uncle who said, you're, you're too fat to be an actress. You know, and I was like, I didn't, at the time I was only running the camera, you know, I was working behind it. I didn't, I never planned on being an actress. It was what was meant to be. What you're meant to be, what you're meant to do is there for everyone. So I guess long answer, but what I'm saying, Joe, just get out of your own way. And mm -hmm. if, if you don't know what I mean by that now, you will, you have to all the energy and creativity of the world is just right here and you grab it and then you get out of your own way and let it come through you. And, you know, it's okay to be afraid, but it's a waste of time. No, I, I agree with that. I mean, uh, myself personally, I'm my own worst enemy at times. Yeah, exactly. I'm, but I'm we have those negative voices. I mean, I don't know if you hear them, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it just, yeah, they're just foolish. They're, they're very loud. <laughs> so yeah. Academy Award winning. And when I <laughs> when I finally go like, hey, I'm not gonna listen to you anymore. Like maybe it says, oh my God, you're so stupid and you have no talent and you blah blah. And I go, hey, if you can't say anything nice to me, don't say anything at all. And then they'll go, oh, you're so stupid. It changes. It's like it could win an Academy Award. Those voices are they're really slippery. And the and the truth is that as I've gotten older. I mean, well, here's my story. I was on Seinfeld. I did that, an episode of Seinfeld and it was difficult. Uh, it was a difficult episode to do. And um, on the way home in my car, my internal voice was like, oh my God, you're so stupid and you have no talent and you're never going to get hired again. And, blah, blah, blah. and I was like, I'm driving. Can you leave me alone for a minute? I'm driving. And then when I got home, I set a kitchen timer for 10 minutes and I laid down on my bed and I said okay you got 10 minutes if you could take me down do it and it started in and it was so you know like you're so stupid and you're ugly and you're fat and you're not funny and 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 the cat doesn't like you and 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 if you got another cat that cat wouldn't like you either and 
And, and I'm like, is that the best you can do, really? Because it's not good enough. And, and then I said, it's what I told you before. If you don't have anything good to say to me, don't say anything at all. Because it, I don't deserve this and I don't want to hear it anymore, you know. And it, I've had great relief from those internal voices. I'm not saying, you know, there aren't things that trigger them. And I go, hey, what, 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 and I go, wait a minute, you know, don't talk to me like that. I mean, life's hard enough if, and without you beating yourself up. Duh, right? I mean, I don't, Joe, I don't know if you have voices like that that tell you this and that and this and that. They're just, you know, the sooner you can l- let them go. I did meet somebody once who go, no, I don't have those. And I was like, I didn't believe her. But, you know, <laughs> the sooner you walk through that fear and just say, I, I, you know, I think of myself, I think that there are probably plenty of people in Wisconsin with their heads down in their arms, you know, in bars going, how did she ever amount to anything? You know, and, and the truth is what I said, I just teeny tiny steps through that fear, that paralyzing fear to only come to this place of understanding that, you know, we're all amazingly perfect, just the way we are. And uh, we're these unique works of art who anyone would be lucky to have us in their life as friends or loved ones or family. And um, it's just an acceptance of that. It's so easy to tell yourself the negative stuff, you know, to listen to that voice. And on the other side of that is the e- the equal voice that says what I just said. You're you're so perfect just the way you are. You know, go for it. And you're you're a good example and role model of going through those fears and the voices in your head. And mm-hmm. I, you mentioned Wisconsin with the bars and oh, how could uh, how could she do that? Well. I think a lot of people in small towns or maybe not as popular states might have that thinking of, oh, I want to be a, you know, an actor, comedian. How am I supposed to do that? I'm in this town of 5,000 people. Well, you you still can. And it's arguably easier today than when Mm -hmm. you started your career since the world's more connected with internet and social media. But uh, do you still get those uh, voices in your head whenever you audition or perform? Or is that kind of gone now since you've done it so much? I don't I don't hear them when I perform. I don't like to audition right now because the, you know, the world changed so much with COVID that uh, nobody calls you in in person anymore to audition. You do it all on video like this. And there's all these rules, you know, must have a certain color background must have you know a certain kind of microphone and a certain kind of light they don't want you to use that ring light that makes that ring in your eyes because it's distracting you know and I hate I'm capable of doing all of that I hate it and also you need to have someone read your lines with you you know and my (laughs) my husband's not very good at it so I never I never he's like why did they say that? Like I go, just, just say it, just say the line, you know? So I hate it. And I, and again, I've just left it up to the universe. If, and, and here's what I want to say about you saying people in small towns, I think that, you know, as Americans, we need to redefine success. I think being a successful father, sister, mother, aunt, that that's an idea of success to me having a family keeping them warm paying your bills or making uh taking time to understand that maybe you need help sometimes and asking for help these are for me these are all definitions of success i don't consider myself successful because i ended up doing something i never planned on doing in my whole life you know and because i live in los angeles in Hollywood. You know, I don't consider myself successful that way. I consider myself successful because I do um, battle those voices and that they really do leave me alone 95% of the time. And that I've surrounded myself with people who offer me unconditional love. I mean, I could find love on any street corner, you know, people who've seen me on TV. I'd rather have someone 
be a jerk to me than be nice to me because they saw me on TV. Mm-hmm. You know, it's about it, it. It's just about the whole journey. This whole life adventure, as far as I'm concerned, is this journey about you with yourself, accepting yourself, who you are. I know you didn't think this is what we we're going to be talking about today, right? <laughs> but accepting who you are and and saying, I am I am so perfect the way I am. I don't need to change anything. And if people don't get me, then goodbye. You know, I, I, there are people who will. Finding your tribe, you know, that's the thing. Self-acceptance. That's That's my idea of success. And so you could live in a small town and you could go to a, you know, if you really want to do um, improvisation or you want to stand up, you can create opportunities for yourself to do it. And maybe that's where you find out, oh, this isn't really what what I want to do. You know, I teach a writing class at the University of Dayton. They have an Irma Bombeck, uh, who was this amazing home home housewife writer that was big and um, her family supports this writing workshop at the University of Dayton every two years. So I teach this class and the place is flooded with all these people who have these dreams. They want to be writers. They want to be stand-up comedians and they get to stand up. There's someone there who arranges for them to do an evening of stand-up and they do it. And I went and my friend was there and she, she did her whole thing. She was really funny. And then she got, got down. She goes, you know, I needed to do that to realize I don't want to be on stage. I want to write the comedy. I want to write the comedy for other people. So unless you take the risk and go ahead and do these things that you think you want to do, you'll never find out if you really truly want to do them or not, or you might not really truly find out what it is you're meant to do because we're all meant to do something. There you go. (laughs) Did that even come close to answering the question? I think think so. That's great. Yeah, that was that was very impressive. No, it was just while you were talking, just I had all these thoughts flying through my head about, you know, finding your tribe. And I was kind of nomadic for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then I found Wapaka. And I've lived in other small uh, towns, but mm-hmm. Wapaka, uh, I've used this, I've used this phrase before that I kind of stole from uh, a guy named uh, Jeff Sargian. He said, he thought of Bloomington as the intellectual Mayberry of the Midwest. And I think of Wapaka like that. I mean, all up and down the street are people who used to be in the corporate world, gave all that up to mm-hmm. have their, you know, their shop or whatever and raise their kids in a nice community. And you, know, you mentioned finding your tribe. I think I truly found mine. Um, I, I love Wapaka. You know, I spent a lot of time in Wapaka as a kid because our next door neighbors had a cottage near there and so we used to go every summer to their cottage and you know i remember pumping water at the well and they were they were on a lake and we would go swimming and then we'd always go into wapaka and have lunch and so i probably spent more time there than i did like any other town around uh central wisconsin and in fact i probably still have i remember one year they they uh the high school dropped a whole bunch of us off at the chain of lakes to go on that chain of lakes canoe, uh, you know, trip. And yeah. by the time I was done, I had these fiberglass burns uh, on the <laughs> top of my legs because we ha- we all had shorts on and the canoe, that fiberglass canoe kept filling with water. And then you have to pick it up and empty it out, pick it up and empty it out. And it would scrape across I, the top of my legs. I'm sure there's still fiberglass embedded in there from that trip but and the casino you know the neighbor kids always went to the casino and then they would take me I was four but I remember thinking it was so exotic <laughs> you know well Paca is just it's so beautiful there are you well, talking Joe's. about the Indian Crossing Casino you... yeah <clears throat> I haven't been back since I was four I think mm. uh, but I know that my friends always talk about who live still live there in Wisconsin to talk about going there to hear music live music so so you said you you grew up in point i mean Mm -hmm. i bring that up because well joe's grandfather my father-in-law had grown up in plover and went to to point and he always had incredibly fond stories of the area over there 
did you enjoy it over there quite a bit growing up? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, no, you know, no, I didn't. Uh, Don't ask me that. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I think you know, I, I, I did, and I didn't. I mean, my story was that my father was ill from the time I was five until I was 15 when he passed away. But also, I mean, earlier when you and I were just chatting, Tim, you said that you grew up near the railroad tracks. Well, I grew up on the south side of Stevens Point, which was literally the wrong side or the other side of the tracks. And I grew up on the block that the cemetery was on. And I spent all of my time playing in the cemetery. It was my first theater, you know, my first mm. cowboy roundup. I just, I played in there and my mother was uh, okay with that because there was no, I mean, the traffic wasn't moving very fast through the cemetery. So, you know, uh, I was pretty safe there. And I think that um, I felt very lonely. I was an only child and I was very sad that my father, uh, you know, was ill and then, and then passed away. And also again, going back to what we're saying, I absolutely had no idea what, why I was alive, what I was supposed to do, what I was meant to do, or what I, you know, I couldn't decide if when I was eight, I either wanted to be a cowboy or an archaeologist. You know, I just knew I liked to collect rocks. And, you know, obviously, neither of those things panned out for me. But um, I just, I felt, uh, I felt less than when I was growing up. And it took me a long time to figure out that I didn't need to feel that way and that it wasn't true, you know. Uh, so I liked, I, I love to come back to Stevens Point because these wide open spaces, you know, for me living, I've lived in large cities since I left Wisconsin and to see the sky, to see the trees, to see weather, to see the sunset, the sunrise, you know, just have clean air if you're not anywhere near Mosinee or any other paper mill, you know, <laughs> but uh, I like, I like seeing that I am, I am a child of four seasons and I don't, the seasons are so subtle in Southern California. I don't really get that. And I, I miss autumn. I crave autumn like other people crave chocolate or alcohol, you know, I just, I need to see autumn and I don't, it doesn't really, the leaves don't turn here till uh, December. And then they, they, one day they're like, Oh, are those leaves turn. Oh, they're gone. And they're just gone that fast, you know? So I did, I enjoyed it, but because of who I was, you know, I needed to go somewhere else and figure that out. So. The fall is always my favorite time as well. Uh, yeah. The winter, actually, the winter is probably my second favorite time. I don't mind the winter at all, you know. And you're missing out because uh, later today we're supposed to be have the beginnings of a blizzard apparently coming through. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I heard. We're, you know, I was doing my live show with my my writing partner Cindy, and she was saying it's she lives in Pennsylvania, and she said, oh "My gosh, it's sixty degrees here. It's so hot." And I said. It's 60 degrees here and we're freezing, you know, it's all about, and it's a dry cold. So, but we're supposed to have a, it's supposed to get down to, to 39 degrees, never gets that cold in uh, Hollywood. And it's supposed to start raining. We're having our own version of a winter blizzard come, come oh. Thursday. So, and then you'll have it after that. I mean, you know, I, I hear people kind of complain about it, but I'm like, well, you're kind of in the middle of Wisconsin in February. I mean, you know, yeah. you got to kind of expect this. Yeah. <laughs> I would I would like winter for about 10 minutes, you know, mm. and then I, <laughs> I'd be ready. I'm not saying that I love Southern California and, you know, there's all those old rock and, you know, oh, no, no, never rains in Southern California, stuff like that. But um, it's dry. It's really dry here. And I'm a Celtic woman. I need a little humidity. And um, you just don't get that here. So mm -hmm. I don't I like the sunshine. I'm not I don't think this is gonna be my final uh resting place. I just haven't found where I want to live yet. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on that. You could come to Wapaka. Yeah, well, I'm gonna come <laughs> visit. 
Well, I'll tell you what, when, when you do come to visit, let me know. And uh, if we have a great little diner here. I'll take you and your, your, uh, your rider friend. Yeah. And it'll Shame. be on me. So well, here's if, the, if you here's, like diners. Yeah, I do. I do like diners, but here's the interesting, you know, the secret, my, my secret is um, I was born allergic to all dairy products. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, nobody knew that nobody really told me that I didn't, I got really sick one day when I moved to, I lived in Manhattan and I got really sick and then I, I figured it out. So I, now that I'm older, I have all these allergies and I'm allergic to all dairy products. I'm allergic to gluten, uh, soy, caffeine. And so, um, I was just before I came today, uh, I'm going with a couple of friends who were taking this river cruise through the Netherlands to see the tulips. And uh, we were just, and my friend Cindy, all of a sudden her doctor told her she was allergic to all those things as well. So I'm glad to have her company, but we've got a third friend. And so we're going to watch her gorge herself on wine and uh, chocolate and cheese, Dutch cheese. And well, we just sit there and look at her, but uh, so I'll come to the diner, but <laughs> don't be surprised if I just order a side salad. Today's episode of Pod Packa is also sponsored by Lucky Tree in downtown Opaca. They are open from 10 to 4 p.m. right now on Mondays through Saturdays. Lucky Tree is a fun and colorful gift shop that will be the perfect destination to get all of your Easter needs, which is coming up sooner than you think. So make sure to visit Lucky Tree in downtown Wapaka. Yeah, I'm curious, too, to kind of get back into it a little bit. What's, uh, you know, you, the Drew Carey show and all that? I mean, I've always been curious. Does everyone kind of get along in those situations, something long running like that? Does, I think, you, you know, really, really have to act sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's the truth. And uh, you, uh, you know, I mean, I was on that show for nine years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are people who are crazy and hard to work with. And it doesn't matter what job, you know, I mean, I've had sometime you should have a show about all the jobs that you've had and then invite me back because mm -hmm. you wouldn't believe the things that I've done to make money to survive. And um, it doesn't matter what, what job you're working at, whether you're on a TV show or, you know, you're working in an office, there's still going to be people who are obnoxious and selfish and, you know, and then there's going to be people who are kind and giving and loving. And that, that's just the way it is. And, you know, my best friend on that show was Craig Ferguson, uh, who, <laughs> you know, played Mr. Wick. Oh, and I know who Craig Ferguson is. <laughs> he's a, he used to live near me. And then uh, one day he just, and he had a radio program, a serious radio program. And I used to go over to his house. He had a studio and I would do that. And then one day I went by and they were gone. You know, so I picked up, and they, he moved back to Scotland. And uh, that's where he lives now in Scotland. And I guess he's on the road or whatever. But, you know, he and I used to just sit around and laugh all the time. And um, it was good to have a friend. There were, there were, it was a d difficult show and yet they were paying me so much money. I certainly wasn't going to leave. And um, so I think that your responsibility when you're in a job like that, if it's something that you can't or don't want to quit, then it's your responsibility to make it a better place to work. And so I tried to make it a good place to work because we have all those guest stars. I mean, I was the reg in the regular cast. Then we had, you know, eight gazillion guest stars coming in all the time. So I felt like I was the hostess of the show and I tried to make sure that everybody felt good about being there because I, I had been guest star many times and I knew what it was like to be accepted and to not be accepted. So it was, um, we still, we still see each other on occasion. You know, I'm closer to some people than I am to others, but you, you end up moving on and Hollywood is such a, small town and yet such a big town you know um so i don't see craig because he's back in scotland and dietrich bader um uh, and i stayed friends and his wife and his kids and we all uh, see each other on occasion and drew's just so busy 
you know, he's just a busy guy. So uh, it was fun, changed me, made me a better person, made me a stronger person. And I own my own home. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, and you got to be a part of a show that had over 200 episodes. Like that's a massive accomplishment. That is really rare. Yeah. Yeah. It was really rare. You know, in other countries like England, if they do a sitcom and it lasts two seasons, they're happy. You know, and here we're like nine, give me 10, give me 10. You know, I, I, I had a great time for nine years. And then I went on to a show called The Secret Life of the American Teenager. And that was just a, supposed to be like a recurring, but I think I did 25, 30 episodes of that, you know, I did a lot of improvisational. We did a lot of touring. I got to work with the USO. I went to, uh, I was the first female comedian in Iraq after, um, you know, shock and awe and um, went to the Persian Gulf, Saudi Arabia, things like that, which again, I'd always wanted to travel. So it was uh, important for me. And it's also important for me uh, to give back because I, I feel I'm grateful every day for the life that, I don't know, did I create this life for myself? I don't know. I mean, like I said, I just walked through the fear. So uh, I'm so grateful for the things that I have and the ability that I have to give back. So I like to do that. Uh, it seems like a really important part of the adventure of being alive. And um, I don't know. That's my story. I loved working with the USO. It was great. I do want to talk more about the Drew Carey show. I did notice that the Drew Carey show, it's not streaming anywhere. And do you know why? And uh, is... I think I do. <laughs> I think I do. Um, you know, we had a lot of musical numbers. And I think that somebody screwed up and they didn't okay. pay the dues for those musical numbers. And um, and so to get that out, like they put the first season out. There was a time after the show went down where, you know, they used to say this about uh, Great Britain, the sun never went down on the British Empire. Well, yeah. the sun never went down on the Drew Carey show for a while. It literally was on every every place, every place you went. And then um, all of a sudden it was gone. And it was they couldn't stream it because, and they couldn't put it out on DVD because it was going to cost so much back money for the musical numbers is what I was told. But I did get a call a couple of years ago from one of the executive producers saying, we're trying to get the Drew Carey show back in reruns because when, you know, right now what, what the world is about and rightly so is diversity. And so on the Drew Carey show, we were a lot more diverse than anybody even remembered. And um, which was kind of interesting. And it also, it's a really funny show. It just was a funny show. And uh, so they're still working on it, but it was, it's about the musical, uh, dues or fees to ASCAP the you know the music places because we did a lot of musical numbers on that show you know well and this seems like a show that could definitely gain a second life you have seen that with shows like The Office uh, Breaking Bad in a mm -hmm. way that's that's these old shows are arguably more popular than new shows like this is something that the drew carey show uh, this was abc uh mm -hmm. i could see this being on hulu and it seems like a great fit on hulu so maybe yeah. that's something that they could try to look into and i feel like it'd be really popular i, I agree. agree it would be yeah i'm gonna i'll call that the executive producer that called me i'm gonna call her and tell her that i did this show and that you said it and that you're 21 <laughs> I know she was working really hard, you know, the, the problem is who's in charge now at Warner brothers. Cause they really own the, the nine, the full nine years. So it would be up to them 
Oh. to get it out there and the people that are in charge now i have no idea how old they are you know they're certainly they're not my age and they're not your age i don't know how old they are and, and, and they're all thinking oh we need something what i don't know i don't even know what i i, I can't watch network tv right now i'm I was, i'm still watching like vikings i like viking shows and oh i love like vikings that. ragnar <laughs> ragnar lothbrook oh my god you know it was and Rollo, man, it was great. I know they were great, and we also all my friends we used to go like we're shield maidens, you know, <laughs> like you can't be sad. A shield maiden wouldn't be sad. They'd go out and just fight. So uh, yeah, I like stuff like that. So I don't really know what's popular. I mean, Joe, what's your favorite TV show right now? Uh, ones that are releasing new episodes right now. Stranger Things, oh, is yeah. amazing. Yeah, uh, but. Well, South Park has also been, st they're still kicking strong. There's they, they, a couple uh, episodes they released for uh, season 26. Uh, those were really well done. They're still as good as ever. Uh, otherwise, old shows are, like I mentioned earlier, are still mm -hmm. insanely popular, like Breaking Bad in the office. Yeah. The yeah. Big Bang Theory. Big Bang. I, mean, I never saw that show. No, you like that? Yeah, it, yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. brilliant. But uh, you know, my one of my all time favorite shows. I always like the show called Northern Exposure. Yeah. And you can't find it streaming anywhere either. Nope. Nope. And right now, when I watch TV now, which actually I watch more reruns and things than anything, but mm -hmm. I feel like it's that old saying, you know, you throw enough stuff against the wall and you hope it kind of sticks. That's kind of how I feel things are. After five, 10 minutes, if I'm not entertained, I'll never watch again. And yeah. I, that seems to be the more the norm now. I don't know, it just seems like there's not a lot of thought put into some things. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm so, not much, sure what... so, much, so much reality TV too, which isn't really reality. <laughs> yeah so, it's just I, I don't know what i'm even looking at anymore people so. don't even but that's what's so interesting about reality tv you know people go but this is real and then they feel like maybe they're less than because they're not this or that but that reality there's so much thought and camera work and organization and uh pushing and planning and uh thought you know from the producers goes into that reality tv it has nothing to do with reality <laughs> at all nothing you know but i know my husband's the same way he won't i go well maybe we should try this because i'm not watching network tv i won't watch it stranger things that's he loves we both love stranger things that was so much fun <laughs> it's just a, it's a you know odd odd time in the world i don't think people really um are willing to take a look at what what other people want to watch you know they're just a lot of paranormal a lot of scary yeah. stuff, you know. Well, I was always a big fan of Justified. I don't know if you ever saw that. Me too. I love and that. Sons of Anarchy. Loved it. Um, loved it. Both of those shows I could relate to because of things I was around as, as a youth, especially mm -hmm. Justified, being in that part, that part of, I think, of Kentucky and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I, it was like being back home again. <laughs> I, I got i loved uh i love that actor timothy oliphant who oh yes justified yeah. and he was also in deadwood which was yes. another great show deadwood and well, just also he was also one of the hitmen in the movie the hitman but more than i mean i really liked him a lot i i have oh i love watching him but uh walt goggins oh yeah was, he's great was, he was great boyd crowder it was just boyd crowder yeah great character that was a that that show was really um the characters were so well written it was very interesting we're we're watching I'm not, I'm not sure yet I'm still not sure but uh a lot of that guy Taylor Sheridan he who's written Yellowstone and mm -hmm. um another show called with Sylvester Stallone called Tulsa King this guy Taylor Sheridan he's like the guy he's just sweeping it and <laughs> all these ideas now and he's just flinging them out there and i don't know it's just you know entertainment it's so important to be entertained uh, it takes you out of your 
sadness or your grief or despondency, wherever you are. And uh, I mean, I had so many people come up to me when I was on Drew Carey and say, you have no idea what the comedy meant to me. My, my father had cancer. We used to watch your show together in the hospital. You know, you helped me so much. And I think that, you know, I was grateful when people would tell me that that's what you want to hear. That's the point, you know, that's the point of uh, being entertained and entertaining. Well, in, my, in my case, I can honestly say from that time frame of my life, the Drew Carey, I'm sure there was other very good shows out, but the Drew Carey show is the only one I remember. I don't even know what was that. I couldn't tell you. That TV show Friends was on. And uh, and I think that, you know, Drew had a way of uh, angering people. <laughs> and he, I think he made all the people from Friends, which was an extremely popular, sh popular show, made them angry with him because um, he wanted the Drew Carey show to be the anti-Friends, you know. Uh, we, and he's he grew up blue collar and that's that's what he wanted this blue collar show about friends sitting around drinking beer and that's and that's what he got and that's what people really enjoyed that and um i liked that about it you know and then he had his friends and then he had the workplace and i was the part of the workplace but what was really fun was doing all those musical numbers and you know here you've got a bunch of people who definitely were not dancers you know <laughs> And uh, we were singing and dancing and big, those big musical numbers. And oh my God, it was so much work. Well, you, you, know, you, did, the, you did the one, uh, it was kind of a dance off with the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yes. And uh, what was the other, oh, I can't God. remember the other one. I, I have in my head, I, I'm hearing um, oh, how to succeed in business. Because I remember having to stand up on this table and, you know, <laughs> Great big, you know. I don't. I mean, I can. I have really good pitch. I played violin for years, but and I, you know, I can sing, but nobody, nobody really wants to pay a lot. But I, but I had to sing like really high soprano. Great big brotherhood of man, a great big, you know, on top of this table, and uh, we did this gigantic musical number. We, we used to have like Tower of Power, the the band. You know, we would hang around with them and Joe Walsh uh, used to come because he was from Cleveland and he would hang around with us. And we do every year we would go do improv in Las Vegas at the MGM for Super Bowl weekend. And uh, when we perform and Joe would come and perform with us and we would have such a good time. And then we go watch the Super Bowl at this gigantic party down in the bowels of the MGM and uh, even now like uh, I watched uh, we haven't performed there in years but I still at Super Bowl I always feel like I gotta go to Vegas gotta go to Vegas and I don't even like Las Vegas you know but um it was it was so much fun but um was there a point to any of that <laughs> was there a point <laughs> uh oh, no. <laughs> no no probably not um it was, uh, there was so many, I remember one time, uh, Drew's going to have a party. And so he sends out an invitation to this party and I take it. I'm mad at him. Mimi's mad. And I run it in the newspaper and everybody in Cleveland shows up at that party and he's totally freaking out. And when I met everybody, I mean, uh, the mayor of Cleveland was at, on, we, we, we all brought in all these people from Cleveland. The mayor of Cleveland was there. That was the first time we saw Joe Walsh. He's, uh, little Richard was on the piano in the backyard uh, playing away. And um, my cousin was in town uh, from, he lives in Oregon now and he was visiting me. And so I put him in that scene and um, everybody thought he was Martin Scorsese, the director. And so mm -hmm. the director of the episode was free. Martin Scorsese's here. What? Oh my God. He was so freaking out. But everybody that had ever lived in Cleveland that now lived in LA was in that scene. And I think that so many people were really proud of that show who were from, if I go now to my mother-in-law lives in Columbus. And when I go to Ohio, people are still like, I, I don't know how they recognize me, but they're like, oh, are you Mimi? You know, and I go, I was, yes. You know. <laughs> 
it was just it was fun it was fun to do it and uh you know the those two it's the musical numbers that keeps it from streaming anywhere and that's too bad so do you think that the drew carey show will ever get revived uh or maybe come back on the air for another season in the future or do you think it's done for sure i mean like they have that the 70s show and now they have the 90s yeah. show or whatever no it'll never come back i i don't i think everybody moved on we we had fun you know dietrich bader was uh who was on drew carey was on this show for quite a while the uh it was called american housewife and he had an idea to have a little reunion so uh and so he did there was an episode i was the lunch lady and drew was in it and ryan styles who's the king of improv uh you know whose line is it anyway and dietrich and we were we were on the show and we had a blast and we all hung around in Drew's trailer and it was just like old times. And we sat there, but we were so much older. And um, and we thought, no, everybody's uh, everybody moved on and there's no way to bring it back. There's just no way to bring it back. And uh, but I would love to see it back on TV in its original form. It was it was fun, really fun awesome. and great musical numbers. So I'm really hoping that that happens. Uh... You know, I understand the, the red tape part of it. Yeah. Well, I, I don't understand the red tape, honestly. It's just irritating to what it is. Yeah. yeah. It's still it's still what I said. It's about the it's whatever age group is running studios now and um and what they think what they're assuming the American public wants to see. And who who is the American public? You know, I mean, it was such a diverse country. How can they even attempt to decide what we all want to watch? I don't know if they're trying to, I don't know if they're trying to, I don't know if they're wondering what we want to watch or if they're trying to just force us into something. It kind of feels forced to me. <laughs> but. Probably. I mean, it's just that they think they, think they know they, because it's all about the advertisers. You know, who's going to want to advertise on the Drew Carey show? I mean, I know that anybody really, but I know that when we were on that show, people used to come and give free gear because they want you to be seen in their gear. So everybody like Drew and the guys and everybody else, they got all this free Nike stuff. They didn't give Mimi any of that stuff because they didn't really want Mimi wearing Nikes and going like, oh, Mimi wears Nikes. But a lot, there were a lot of people that I did a course commercial, you know, because they, they wanted to see Mimi do that. But um, it's interesting, you know, these people that are running these studios and that are greenlighting these TV shows are trying to figure out what the public wants to watch and uh, and who will advertise on there. Who, you know, like you're not going to advertise to me for some snowboarding vacation because I'm not going to go on that vacation. So, but that's, that's what they want to advertise on something that would be geared towards joe you know mm -hmm. so but who has the who's who are the buyers in our country who has the money to shop who's shopping you know who's buying insurance who's buying whatever it is that's being sold it's like older people who've saved some money for <laughs> old age you know we're the ones like joe can you go out and pay for a snowboarding vacation or buy yourself a snowmobile or something i don't know maybe you can but you know what i mean they can have the medicare ads on during the drew carey show or something no that's right <laughs> i know that'd be painful wouldn't it but true true uh, one of the gazillion prescription ads i, I know that i always write those cool. down and ask my doctor about every one of them too like they suggest on the tv ad he likes that <laughs> I like a good drug that's got a uh, catchy theme song that I can oh, sing, yeah. you know. I like when they, yeah, I like when they kind of jazz it up to, like, you know, or they're trying to, you know, abbreviate it so it sounds cool, you know, yeah. the disease or whatever. I'm just like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I like the side effects too, like may cause death. If this happens, call your doctor. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> or if you're allergic to it, how do you know you're allergic to it till you take it and have an allergic reaction, you know? <laughs> It's, I, it's crazy. 
I don't know. It may cause hot dog finger or golden retriever head. There's that's a lot a, to make fun of out there. That's for sure. Oh my gosh. I know. <laughs> Do you have any final questions for Kathy, Dad, since we're getting close to the end here? Yeah. I mean, uh, we have a mutual friend who actually put, helped put this together. I was just curious. I mean, did you, did you go to, did you actually go to high school and stuff with her? I did. I did. Okay. Uh, so you managed yeah. to keep lifelong friends all the way since mm -hmm. school. Yeah, I think that's important. And uh, there were eight of us, maybe nine. There were nine of us, you know, girls that hung around together. And uh, and Barb was one of them. And we still stay in touch. And um, we're planning. We have reunions uh, where it's just just us we get together we usually go up to door county and rent a big house and uh, i'm trying to plan a reunion for 2024 so that we can all and we get together and we cook and we laugh and we talk and it's like all the years haven't you know gone by we're just who we were back in high school and we were that group that we were like the good girls you know we were just the regular girls and um, we all went, we always went to all the basketball games and, you know, we just, Barb was the beautiful one. She was, she's so beautiful. She's really a beautiful woman. And um, we all just had fun hanging out with each other and then split off after high school, but stayed in touch. It's important. Do you have anything, any, uh, anything coming up where you're going to be on stage or screen? I'm coming to Wisconsin uh, in July, and uh, I'm going to be up on Washington Island in Fragrant, Fragrant Isle Lavender Farm, and we'll mm -hmm. be um, doing uh, my writing partner, Cindy Ratzlaff, and I are going to be there July 13th. We're going to be on Washington Island, and then uh, and then we're going to work our way down to the Mustard Museum down in Middleton, Wisconsin, and we're going to be there on Saturday the 15th. And um, we're just meeting with people who follow us on social media and uh, doing that because this last year we came out with this inspirational deck of cards and each card is um, interesting in the sense that the front is a queenism, which is like a quick inspirational blast. Um, like the one on the cover of the box says, if they don't, uh, she thought if they don't want you to dance uh, in the grocery store aisles, why do they play music? You know, stuff like that. And um, each one of these cards says there's some for love and friendship and hope and courage. And the back is a postcard. So if you pull one and you think, wow, this this makes sense for my friend Tim, I'm going to send it to him. You could just address it, put a stamp on it, mail it out. And um, so we we developed those. We did all the work, created all the queenisms, and you can get them on our web website, queenofyourownlife.com, or just Google my name and everything pops up and it, it'll give you, because everybody goes, what's the name? It's queenofyourownlife.com. So that's what's out there now. And those are my only appearances in Wisconsin. If you have very many tv appearances um, no but, but, uh. <laughs> i mean right after the show I, I did for the longest time i don't think i've done any tv for a couple of years you know during covid it just wasn't happening and uh yeah. again there's this whole thing that's happening in hollywood right now diversity which should have happened a long time ago but i don't think i'm a very you know older caucasian woman it's not a very popular demographic right now and that's just fine you know, it'll all settle back out and then it'll just be about everybody. We're all alike. We're all more alike mm -hmm. than different. And, you know, it needs to be more mixed up. So that's kind of a good thing. So I just keep myself busy doing a, a, a lot of small writing, you know, mm -hmm. small writing things, but no TV, but anybody that wants to hire me is certainly welcome to. <laughs> yeah, that's what I say. <laughs> I'm asking this for a friend of ours, Andy's case, because he is really, he has done a lot of improv in his past. And I I would like to know more about when you were on Whose Line Is It Anyway? And you got the beyond that with a, a couple of your uh, co-workers on the Drew Carey show. 
Uh, that's like the top of the uh, pyramid when it comes to improv. What was it like doing improv comedy at the highest level? Well, interesting. And the thing about Who's Line, uh, you know, is that it, they, they were doing it in London. You know, they would do it in England, but Ryan Stiles, who's, who I consider to be the king of improv, he's really one of the funniest men in the entire world. And he hated to fly. So he suggested that Drew produce it in the United States. And that's why they moved it to the United States so that he didn't have to fly. But it was uh, the same guy who produced it in the UK came to the States to do it too. And I actually only did this, did that show once because it was mostly about Ryan and Colin Mockery. Uh, they were really the leads of that. And there weren't a lot of women on there. But it was, it's so much, uh, it's such hard work. That show is more hard work than any other TV show I'd ever been on. And, uh, but I really, uh, I enjoyed myself, but I did so much improvisation. You know, we had, we formed a group called, after I was with Drew Carey in Cleveland and we were at the improv and they wanted him to get up and do his set, you know, his stand up set. But he hadn't done it for a long time, so he was really nervous about doing it. And Ryan said, well, let's just get up and do some improv. And Drew was like, oh, OK, which is fine, because that was my background. So we got up and it's very addicting. And I heard this click for Drew when he was doing it. And so that after that, he created all of these opportunities for us to do improvisation. We used to perform every week at the improv in Hollywood and then um and then he spread out and then we st started to perform in Las Vegas every year. We were there a couple of times a year. And then like I, I told you this before, then we went the USO, we went out with the USO, we went to Iraq and Persian Gulf and Saudi Arabia and uh, Kuwait and all those places. And we just did improvisational comedy. And I think, I remember thinking at the time, that when we, especially when we were in Las Vegas, because we actually got paid for it, because improvisation is one of those things you do out of love and you never get paid for it. And I remember thinking I was probably, and we, we weren't making a lot of money, but I thought, you know, I'm probably one of the highest paid women in improvisation today. And because they just, you do it, you love it, you don't get paid. And I think that it's, uh, I used to teach improvisation for the longest time because it's such a great tool for life. You know, everything that you do is improvisation. If you're at a party, you're at a bar and you're having a conversation with someone, that's improvisation. You're, everyone's born knowing how to be a good improviser. You know, you had a truck and you're like, run, run, run. nobody stopped and judged you. That noise is not how a truck sounds. You know, or like when we were girls, little girls, we'd like have a tea party and, you know, make cakes out of sand. People didn't go, hey, that's just sand. It's not cake. You know, nobody's judging you when you're little and you just sort of grow out of that. But improvisation is, I mean, I, I just improv my way through this whole thing with you and you improv it, your dad did, you know, it's a skill that helps you no matter what job you take in life. So I, I always encourage anyone to form an improv group, you know, find a way to take a class. It's, uh, it's fun. It opens you up. And it makes you more confident. Andy's talking about, or is actually our pastor. So it's, you can see it shows up in his sermons. Yeah, he, can, yeah. he can, he can add some, I mean, it's some of his stuff. I mean, it's, it's pretty funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I think that's people's biggest fear because, you know, there's many, there's improvisational comedy, which is what I did. There's also improvisation just, you know, like I said, the conversation in the bar or whatever, you know, and of course, then there's drama, but most yeah. people think they have to be funny, but you, you don't have to be funny. There's, there's just rules and, and the basic ones, like, who are you? Where are you? What makes this day important? And you're like, what? It's like writing a good story. And that's what you're doing while you're talking. But also in improv, you never want to say no. And the perfect example of that is in, um, like I taught in New York and I taught in California. And in, in California, if someone says to you, 
oh, the sky is so blue. Then you go, oh, it is blue. It's the, the color blue of my mother's eyes when she used to put on that blue apron and make pancakes all the time. You know, in New York, if someone said, oh, the sky is so blue, they go, that's not blue. That sky was never blue. What, what's the matter with you? That's not blue because New Yorkers are a little more aggressive, you know? So it's about never say no. People don't want to see an argument. They want to see in your mind, you go, yes. So you say the sky is blue. And I go, yes. And in my head or out loud, and I go, yes. And, you know, I love blue. It's my favorite color. And then they go, yes. And blue is a great color. Uh, I think green is wonderful. Oh, yes, green. And you you build on the information with that yes in your head. This is one of those things that women like to be heard and listened to. And so if you constantly say no, no, no to them, you know, if you're looking for a girlfriend, they're going to walk away. But if you say yes, and that's so interesting, how did you figure that out? You know, well, you're going to have girlfriends coming out your top pocket there. Yeah. <laughs> Improv, it's a great tool for everybody, no matter what uh, career path you choose. I'll have a couple last questions here. First, you mentioned how uh, Ryan was the king of improv. Mm -hmm. Why was he the king of improv? And was it because he made everyone better around him or was it hard to keep up with him? <clears throat> he, he's just the funniest guy ever. I mean, his mind, the way his mind works is amazing. And, uh, you know, the thing about improv is it is a group thing. And, uh, you know, you need to be conscious of everybody around you. If the if you look good and you make the group look good, then then you've accomplished something, you know. And I think that Ryan was um, completely capable of doing that. And he and Colin Mockery together were amazing. And they still they still tour. Not not Colin. Uh, Colin was doing something else. Actually, Colin was uh, off Broadway doing a show called Hiprov, which was half hypnosis and half improv, and it was a huge success. This the he was with a guy he'd hypnotize different people out of the audience, and then Colin would come out in the second half and improv with them after they were hypnotized. So. That was interesting. And I think they're going to be, the show is so um, successful that I think that they're going to be in Las Vegas if you're ever anywhere near there, you know. But um, Ryan, Ryan and uh, uh, another guy that we all, Greg Proops, another guy, Jeff Daniels, and then um, a, a really, really funny guy, Joel Murray. His brother is Bill Murray. And the four of them still tour. Uh, I think last year, I had just had lunch with Greg Proops, and he said they did 101 shows last year. So they tour all over across the country doing improvisation. If you get a chance to see them anywhere, go. They're at Indian casinos and universities and different theaters. They're, they're still, and then you'll know what I'm saying. He's the king of improv, and um, they all work so brilliantly together. Uh, but Ryan, if any chance you ever get to see Ryan, there's no one funnier than him, I think. Oh, oh definitely. You can tell on the show. It's just what they do. It's just like, okay, yeah. But yeah. the connection that they all have on Whose Lines in any way is not going to be replicated really anywhere else. No, no, nothing. They've been together for a long, long time now, and they just, they're just seamless. You know, they're just so funny. I, I love those guys, yeah. My last question for you is, who in your career that you have worked with has inspired you or influenced you the most? You know, I'm going to say uh, Marion Ross. She played oh. the mom on Happy Days, and she also played Drew Carey's mom. And when she came to be on the Drew Carey show, you know, I had admired her for years. She's an amazing actress. And when she got in that show, we became huge and lifelong friends. And she used to invite my husband and I over. She treated us like family. And we would go to her house all the time. She and I went on a, she and Florence Henderson, who had been the mom on uh, 
the Brady Bunch, were the they were the godmothers of the Princess Cruise Line. And uh, Marion felt like they owed her one more cruise. So she and her assistant were going to go on this two week cruise of the British Isles. And she suggested that I go with her. So my writing partner, Cindy and I, and the we we all went and we went on this two week cruise. And Marion is such a giving person. She she was kind to everyone on that cruise. And they had us do the voice of the sea, which is was their parody of the voice that show the voice. And they had yeah. spent fifty thousand dollars on these spinning chairs. And um, Marion had never seen that show, The Voice. And so I was, I said, I'll be there for you. Don't worry. No matter what happens, no matter what you say, I'll cover. And so they get there and they're like, The Voice of the Sea, you know, we're somewhere outside of Ireland, you know. And they spin, they go, Marion Ross, and they spin the chair and the spotlight hits her. And she goes, Oh, I can't wait to call the Fonz and tell him how much fun I'm having. And she just, snapped the minute that light hit her she just snapped right into it she's a brilliant entertainer she's a brilliant actress she's 94 years old now wow. and we're still friends she's still uh out there i spoke to her yesterday on the phone here's a woman that's a perfect example of there's always something more you know, you're going to reach a certain age, you know, where you're 65 or whatever. And you think there's nothing left. Marion Ross is a perfect example. There's always something more. She's a brilliant <laughs> actress. She's just walked through the fear and always showed up and was kind. So I think Marion Ross. Thank you so much for being on Podpaca. Uh, you're invited back anytime to Podpaca and to Wapaca. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take you up on that. And uh, hopefully I'll see you in July. I'm going to come through there somehow. I was just going to uh, tell Kathy how much I appreciated her over the years. I mean, Thanks. It's, it's people like Kathy and the Drew Carey show and all that actually just, you know, let's face it, made life just a little bit better. We were trying, that's for sure. You know, we just wanted to entertain and have people you know have the freedom to laugh and uh i mean we we knew that's what we needed and we hope that that's what was happening with them well okay. we really appreciate you kathy thank you and once again thank you for this you're welcome can you see it okay <laughs> yes i can okay <laughs> it's burned in my memory <laughs> burned in my memory